So I'd like to welcome everybody to this um, session on qualifying and minimizing the impacts of wildfires. I'm really excited about the three presentations you're going to hear. Um, I've worked in the social impacts of fire management for 20 years. And one of my big frustrations is that it, we put a lot of energy into fire behavior and fire ecology. And when we talk about the social, it boils down to the wild and urban interface and that's it. So I'm very happy to, that you're going to get a chance to hear three presentations that are do a great job of providing a lot more contextualization to thinking about what exactly do we mean when we talk about the wildland urban interface and or the societal impacts and how those uh, affect um, the problem and also what we can do to minimize and mitigate the potential effects. I want to um, thank everybody for the uh, people who are sponsoring this present, this uh, sesh, the symposium. A lot of really important people are contributing and uh, helping this make this happen. So please pay attention to them and, and give them your attention. Um, and if you have any questions for the presenters, you can ask them by using the Q&A window that's over on the side. Uh, at the end of each presentation, if we have time, we'll all pick a few questions that have been asked and um, we'll have a discussion and then we'll move on to the next one. And hopefully at the end, we'll have um, a little extra time for additional questions. But we can also answer questions in the Q&A um, outside of individual presentation times. Well, so with that, I'm going to move on to the first presentation, which is Lillian Liang and Mason Thurman, who are with the Fire Safe Council. Um, the label may just say Mason Thurman, but it's actually both of them are speaking, and I will turn it over to them now. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lillian Liang. Thank you for having us. And I'm Mason Thurman, and we are calling in from Occupied Chumash Land in Simi Valley, California. We are California Climate Action Corps uh, AmeriCorps alumni that have been partnered with California Fire Safe Council for the past seven and a half months, and we're really excited to share our research with you today. Um, as many of us have experienced shifts in California's fire regime, along with social factors such as population growth in the wildland urban interface, or the WUI, have contributed to the destruction of large swaths of social and natural biomes. This is driving Californians to organize at the local level to protect their communities. Meanwhile, the impacts of wildfire exacerbated by climate change are disproportionately felt by vulnerable groups. As there isn't a current widespread understanding of the relationship between social, environmental, and uh, specific wildfire vulnerability, we were compelled to identify these intersections and uh, compare them to ongoing community-led wildfire adaptation. So today, we'll provide a brief introduction to the community wildfire space, discuss our map of wildfire vulnerability, which extends beyond current models, and showcase pertinent results of our statewide survey of community-led efforts. Um, our host organization, California Fire Safe Council, passes, passes through funds from the U.S. Forest Service, CAL FIRE, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, along with many other agencies, on to local fire mitigation and resilience organizations. California Fire Safe Council, or CFSC, uh, interacts with many different community-led organizations, including local fire safe councils, which mobilize residents to work on wildfire preparedness, uh, prevention, and mitigation. These fire mitigation organizations are a key mechanism for ensuring that wildfire mitigation investments are actually addressing local needs in relation to wildfire. But comprehensive data of these organizations programming and their vulnerable communities serve are lacking. So to address this gap, the California Fire Safe Council brought on five California Climate Action Corps AmeriCorps fellows, which are us. Um, we collaborated to develop a spatial vulnerability analysis and a comprehensive needs assessment survey of fire mitigation organizations throughout the state of California. The overlay of social and wildfire vulnerability will be useful for CFSC programs and outreach efforts and is easily reproducible, which is why we're happy to share it with you today. And the survey results are particularly pertinent to wildfire mitigation or organizations and grantors. The current model of wildfire hazard potential is really useful, but here we present a fuller picture of wildfire vulnerability, which considers a community's ability to respond and recover from wildfire, also known as a community's adaptive capacity, as well as projected climate change impacts on wildfire. 
These are potentially powerful data sets for agencies to take into account, especially when prioritizing funding across California's diverse landscape. Um, so we combine several different map layers in a weighted overlay, and we'll discuss each of the component layers and show an example uh, of implementation of the final composite layer. Here, you're seeing the geographic extent of where the vulnerability analysis was performed. A deep learning model was utilized through ArcGIS to identify all of the structures within California. A quarter mile defense zone and an additional one and a quarter mile threat zone buffer were applied to create a one and a half total mile total buffer around all structures within CAL FIRE's state responsibility area. A negative one and a half mile buffer was then applied into local and federal responsibility areas that border state responsibility areas to prevent the arbitrary exclusion of communities bound by multiple jurisdictions. Um, broadly, our weighted overlay places equal weight on wildfire risk factors and adaptive capacity factors. So wildfire risk factors include wildfire hazard potential, as well as extreme heat and drought to account for climate change impacts on wildfire. To represent adaptive capacity, we use Cal Envio Screen 4 this layer is weighted at 50% because it captures vulnerability to wildfire that is not included in the USFS wildfire hazard potential layer, which you'll see next. The Cal Enviro Screen 4 is a composite score based on analysis of communities' pollution burden, the consideration of their age and health, and socioeconomic indicators. So pollution burden is a relevant indicator of the public health Hub, excuse me, public health risks of wildfire smoke as smoke impacts both the quantity and toxicity of air particulates during a wildfire event. By including existing pollution burden as a factor, we recognize longstanding environmental injustices and broaden the scope of wildfire destruction beyond land and structures burned. Socioeconomic indicators are critically related to wildfire adaptation because of the costs associated with adequate preparation for a wildfire, such as home hardening, smoke, prote smoke protective measures, and recovery, especially in areas with cost prohibitive or non-existent wildfire insurance. Hazard mitigation efforts also often miss vulnerable populations due to cultural relevancy and inaccessibility of programming. So on this map you'll see, or on this layer, excuse me, red indicates higher scores or more pollution and sensitivity in an area, and green indicates lower scores. So this layer is the United States Forest Service wildfire hazard potential, and we weighted that at 30%. This layer is commonly used in the wildfire space to assess the hazard potential of a particular area to wildfire. The layer is based upon spatial estimates of likelihood and intensity and indicates which fires would be difficult to suppress due to specifically extreme behavior. Areas with higher wildfire hazard potential values are shown in red. They represent fuels with a higher probability of experiencing extreme fire behavior, and then green would be a lower probability. And this layer, the third layer, is CalBrace's extreme heat days 2040 through 2060. Uh, extreme heat was given a weight of 10% because it represents projected impacts of climate change on wildfire and because extreme heat directly impacts wildfire risk. Extreme heat reduces vegetation moisture content, which then causes the vegetation to be more like more likely to ignite and burn in a wildfire. Additionally, according to the EPA's Reducing Urban Heat Islands Compendium of Strategies, extreme heat can increase likelihood of heat-related illness, especially in people with pre-existing cardiovascular, respiratory, and other conditions. According to the California Department of Public Health, Health's CalBRACE Climate and Health Profiles, due to historic disinvestment uh, in parks, shade tree, and other cooling elements, Communities of color and low-income communities tend to be affected disproportionately by heat. So darker red here indicates a higher number of projected extreme heat days, while yellow indicates fewer extreme heat days. And this layer, the FEMA National Risk Index uh, annualized frequency of drought layer, we weighted at 10%. Similarly to extreme heat, drought reduces vegetation moisture content on a broad scale and increases the risk of wildfires. It also, drought also negatively impacts air quality, leads to drier conditions, and that compounds negative health impacts for populations that are already experiencing air pollution. Um, so similarly on that layer, the darker red was uh, indicated a higher um, number of drought event days. Yellow would be lower. Um, this layer, the composite layer, 
is CFSC's current iteration of vulnerability to wildfire. So this map is intended to be used as a more encompassing guide to understanding vulnerability beyond wildfire threat or WUI designation. High vulnerability areas, uh, which are shown in red, no, very high, um, can be used to suggest the direction of outreach, education, funding, and resources to specific communities. And on this next slide, we're going to show you how to how we implement this map um, as a case example of how we can use it to directly engage with communities. We've shown counties with really different vulnerability scores. So we've overlaid also the known, the identified um, fire mitigation organizations on top. Um, they're represented uh, with dots and then text next to that dot with the labels. On the left side, San Diego County has a wide range of vulnerability, including very high and many, many fire mitigation organizations. On the right side, you'll see Tehama and Glen counties with predominantly high and very high vulnerability with a, a, a slight less range there. These counties have very few uh, fire mitigation organizations. So California Fire Safe Council can use this information provided by the map to more effectively reach communities that are not already well saturated with uh, wildfire mitigation organizations and thus resources. So we should note that a possible reason for San Diego County success could be um, the large population, but despite its success, the need for consistent funding is a commonality between all organizations in the wildfire space. So our geospatial vulnerability analysis relies upon institutionalized or top-down data that assesses vulnerability via large-scale data sets. It is highly useful for statewide analysis, but it results in a model with limited perspective of wildfire vulnerability on the community level. In tandem with our mapping project, we conducted a statewide survey to ground the map in a landscape inventory of current wildfire mitigation and resilience efforts. This allowed organization members to self-identify their community's vulnerability or disadvantages for a more bottom-up picture. Our survey is useful beyond our questions asked about vulnerability as well, since they contributed to a statewide directory of fire mitigation organizations. The survey questions we asked can be categorized into three main sections. We asked for organization details, current programming and demographic information, which included about both the organization and the community served. And we'll share the results of the survey in the coming slides. We solicited surveys from the combination of fire mitigation and resilience organizations in our database with CFSC, as well as with the National Fire Protection Association's database of all FireWise USA sites in California. And that totaled to 1,042 surveys to 962 organizations. Our roster was identified via research online and internal grantee databases. And though we may not have captured every single community conducting fire mitigation work, this is the most comprehensive roster of active organizations in California that CFSC has compiled. So where are these organizations? This map shows the geographical spread of recipients and organizations with known locations. Um, what are these organizations? We received 177 responses to our survey, and the spread of respondent organization types is shown here. While the majority of respondents were fire safe councils or FireWise USA sites, the distribution of organization type is quite wide and also includes home and property owners associations, community organizations, local agencies, resource conservation districts, other types of nonprofits, and for profit organizations. We asked what current wildfire preparedness and mitigation programming these organizations have in place. Respondents can choose or could have cho chosen one or more options from the list shown on this slide. And these are all common community centered interventions to mitigate destruction of life and property due to wildfire. Overall, the most common programming among respondents is education and outreach at 86% with defensible space work coming in close second and chipping in third. Those top three responses center wildfire mitigation efforts on the home and break, fuel breaks and prescribed burns are often utilized in strategic areas around communities. Not shown on the slide, 64% of organizations had a community wildfire protection plan, 
or CWPP and or a local hazard mitigation plan or LHMP. These are both local planning documents created in collaboration with local governments, community members, and other stakeholders, and they often provide structure and priority to projects conducted by these local organizations. So when organizations are unincorporated, which is often the case when they're small or emerging, they rely on fiscal sponsorship. This is an agreement with an incorporated entity in order to manage funds and apply for grants. About a third of our respondents had a fiscal sponsor and we found a fairly even spread across types of fiscal sponsors from government, resource conservation districts and fire departments with about half of respondents selecting other, um, including fire safe councils and other nonprofits. We also asked organizations to rank their priority concerns from this list. The choice was the, uh, with the highest average score was gaps in funding. Issues with funding seem to be a commonality between many small organizations attempting to secure funding from a pool of competitive grants. And on the right are direct quotes from survey respondents related to gaps in funding. We asked what forms of training and educational resources organizations are interested in receiving from CFSC as well. And notifications of grant opportunities was the top choice with 76% of organizations. The next most desired form of support was how to find grants at 51%. And these both align with the top ranking priority concern, revealing that organizations are most interested in securing funding, at least in how they relate to CFSC. Uh, we also asked organizations to choose which races and or ethnicities, as well as which age range best identifies the members and staff of their organizations. The results reveal that 84% of respondents identified the race or ethnicity of their members and staff as white. Nearly 70% identified the median age of their organization as 50 plus. And in future surveys, we'd recommend further disaggregating that group to 50 is 65 and 65 plus. We recognize that re these results are only rough proxies of representation in the wildfire space. Nevertheless, we believe these results show a need to collect demographic information and support a more diverse and inclusive community-led wildfire adaptation space. A study by Davies et al. in 2018 um, confirms the anecdotal perception that in the US, most people who live in the wildland urban interface or WUI are white and socioeconomically secure. However, where there are majority Black, Hispanic, or Native American census tracts, they do experience significantly greater vulnerability to wildfire when you take um, adaptive capacity factors in, in account as well as wildfire hazard. And in our survey, we saw lower representation of these groups. In addition to asking for demographic information about the organizations, we also asked for information about the community served by the organization. So we asked organizations what languages are primarily spoken by the communities they serve. 98% se selected English and about a third selected Spanish. And the next highest selection was Mandarin with about 2.8%. And this shows a need for materials provided in Spanish and other non-English languages. Next, we asked organizations an open-ended question about whether their programming is intended to reach a specific audience and analyze the results. A majority of the respondents, about two thirds, didn't dis, uh, identify any specific audience. And some people identified specific audiences based on age with the most common specific programming identified for the elderly. Others identified programming targeting a marginalized group, most commonly for homebound or disabled and low income members of communities. Finally, respondents indicated they targeted specific resident types, most commonly home property or landowners. Um, and the two most common types of programming that existed for specific audiences were defensible space financial assistance and education and outreach. Um, we also, finally, we also asked respondents to name any specific disadvantages faced by their community as a way to speak to their own community's vulnerability. We'll share abbreviated analysis of results of this open-ended question in the next couple of slides. About one in five respondents indicated an economically distressed community 
Other marginalized groups include elderly, homebound or disabled, and low language access. Next, most commonly, about 12% of respondents identified insufficient urban infrastructure as a disadvantage in their community. This category includes insufficient evacuation routes, communications and internet access, and water infrastructure. About 5% of respondents indicated interagency conflict and barriers as a disadvantage in their community. And other disadvantages named include extensive fire trauma and a frequently changing population. So to conclude, we've been experiencing mega fires in recent years for which agencies and communities are still accounting and paying the costs. It's clear that Californians need these community led mitigation and adaptation strategies to adapt now. So notably, the California Council on Science and Technology released a report in 2020 outlining a framework to evaluate the cost of wildfire in California. Importantly, it called for policymakers to invest in mitigation and resilience efforts and pointed out that improved accounting of the cost of wildfire necessitates more formalized statewide data collection. We hope that our project has built capacity for CFSC to contribute to that effort. The map we've shown is intended to be used as a more encompassing guide to understand wildfire vulnerability than current models of just wildfire and structured density by also including adaptive capacity, public health impacts of smoke and climate change projections. These models can be used to direct outreach or funding and areas of high vulnerability and low programming may be of particular interest to policymakers or agencies that direct outreach efforts or funding. Finally, we encourage CFSC to maintain contact with fire mitigation and resilience organizations from the survey on an annual basis and serve as a statewide directory to strengthen community networks. Thank you so much for your time and for holding this space for us. We're happy to address any questions you may have and our contact information is shown on the slide. If we have um, a couple of minutes, we can start to address um, questions okay. that are in the chat and then any that we don't get to, we'll try to reply within the chat. Um, yeah, so for the vulnerability map, how did you determine how much to weight each layer? Do you wanna, do you um, yeah, sure. So as Mason mentioned, broadly our weighted overlay places equal weight on wildfire risk factors and adaptive capacity factors. And Cal Screen has given the most weight of all factors because we wanted to emphasize adaptive capacity's role in wildfire. And that is, um, I think, the key of what extends this model beyond current models. Mm -hmm. And in itself, Cal Screen is composite, composite index of 18 factors um, of pollution burden and population characteristics. So that effect is a little bit diluted amongst those factors. Um, the wildfire risk factors uh, were wildfire hazard potential as well as extreme heat and drought as climate change impacts on wildfire. And so wildfire hazard potential received the most weight at 30 and extreme heat and drought were each given 10% weight because they represent projected impacts of climate change on wildfire. And yeah, yeah. anything to add? No, that's perfect. Okay. What is the spatial resolution for the vulnerability map? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head. Yeah, we can definitely find that out and put that one back in the chat. Um, a GIS specialist who is not present right now <laughs> um, did help us with that while we did uh, a lot of the um, vision and design for that one. Can you say more about what you learned to read? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, so I want to thank you both for filling in for me because when I thought my mic was on and it wasn't. So the next, oh. one, okay. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you covered. Um, the next question is basically asking about the low number of respondents that pick prescribed burns um, as a method to use, and they're curious because of the discussion that's going about indigenous methods and more use of prescribed fire and where that fits. Yeah, I think there are a few different. Um, factors obviously affecting, I, I noticed that too is like a rather low number of responses. Um, I would say it, I think 
So my understanding um, and experience with uh, cultural burning and prescribed burning as well is that there is a bit more of a resurgence now and, and people uh, within the wildfire space are certainly um, taking note of its importance, uh, relevance and, and like legitimacy. Um, but a lot of the organizations that I think were responding to our survey and participating are fairly well established. And so um, my understanding, yes, yeah, is, is potentially that they may have not completely caught on to this um, and that there is a lot of um, like social hesitancy around intentional burning. Um, from what, from my very <laughs> limited perspective, um, my understanding uh, about where fire management is headed in that regard is that these conversations are definitely being had um, within, like within uh, our host organization, host organization, <laughs> California Fire Safe Council, um, which is responsible for then forwarding a lot of these like large block grants onto um, more yeah, onto the local organizations. So I know that at least for our, or our organization, um, yeah, they're, they're willing to uh, fund these types of projects and at the local level, more folks are becoming interested. There's just pushback from a lot of residents. Um, and yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump in on that. Um, and I don't want to take your space, but there's actually a lot of work about prescribed burning and social acceptance and that sort of thing that, um, mm -hmm. And feel free to contact me if you want more information on that because I've done a lot of work on that. But I wanted to follow up with, I really liked on your vulnerability map, um, the fact that you use multiple layers, which is fantastic. Very few people do. Um, and that you included smoke issues and smoke impacts because that's, I think, one thing that gets overlooked and is obviously we were all experiencing increasingly important. Was that a question or did you pick up that that was, I mean, I saw in the educational resources of the communities that they're all talking about defensible space and home hardening. Did you pick mm -hmm. up that they're also beginning to think more about how to help their communities deal with smoke impacts? And then um, along that question, is the map available online as a tool for planners or jurisdictions? And then we'll move on to Gnome. Okay, perfect. Um, the first question. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, from from my experience personally, I didn't pick up on that pulse that a lot of these uh, wildfire mitigation and resilience organizations are focusing on smoke. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that that is um, definitely something that like within the space of like fire adapted communities is an mm -hmm. um, emerging topic. Um, and I think that the issue of smoke and public health has definitely captured a lot more energy uh, anecdotally of like um, different populations that aren't traditionally involved in wildfire preparation and resilience. So we think it's a really um, good opportunity for us to use this map to try to expand the conversation and include the communities and expand the communities that are involved in wildfire preparedness work, because it really is such an intersectional space mm -hmm. um, and should be representative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's often left out of the wooey discussion. So I think that's yeah, right. certainly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is the map available online for others to be able to use? So as far as we know, the map will remain internal to California Fire Safe Council, which is why we highlighted um, the formulation and exactly how we got to produce this layer. So um, all of the data is uh, the source data is certainly available online. Um, and it just requires a weighted overlay and a formulation um, on ArcGIS. So um, you can create your own layer essentially. Um, but the, the directory will soon be available online um, of where all these organizations are. And then that data will also be um, available. Fantastic. Thank you both for a very good presentation um, and really, really interesting work. And I would actually encourage you to find a way to make that map available online, perhaps not with the communities, but just with the combination of vulnerability, because I, I can see how many people would find it useful and no need to repeat the wheel. Yeah, I agree. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now we're going to move on to Noam Rosenthal. And he is a PhD candidate with UCLA, and he's looking at um, hazards of wildfire, particular matter, and heat in California. Take it away, Noam. Great. Thank you, Sarah, and everyone for joining in. Um, so yeah, today I'll be excited to present uh, this work that I've been uh, researching over the last few months. 
so, ooh, sorry, the thing just scrolled here. So, you know, as this headline really hammers home, we're increasingly now used to not only having uh, severe wildfires throughout the state, but overlaid with that are record heat waves um, that are equally, uh, you know, threatening. cut out from everybody, so you might hold on. Um, I think everybody is cut, he's, no has cut out from for everyone, and the tech people are currently working to address that. No, I don't know if maybe refreshing your browser, if you can hear me or not. I think you might have lost no. Okay, are you back now? So go ahead and um, put him back on stage if you can. Hold tight, everybody. We're working on it. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Excellent. Welcome back. I got logged off and then could only be uh, an attendee, not a participant. Um, <laughs> and of course, right when you're talking. <laughs> well, yeah. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, just getting back at it. So, you know, I was mentioning how this headline, uh, you know, sort of, I think, brings home the message that it's not only uh, heat that we're seeing in the summers, but they tend to also co-occur uh, with wildfire. And indeed, you know, this isn't necessarily much of a surprise since uh, studies have found, specifically Goss and colleagues, that at least for every in, uh, degree centigrade increase in autumn temperatures, there tends to be a corresponding 20% increase in fire weather index um, metrics. Uh, this is sort of an index that the Canadian Forestry Service provides, um, which is a combination of both meteorological uh, factors that contribute to wildfire as well as sort of wind. Um, and the aridity of fuels. And so it's not necessarily surprising that we'll see those two co-occurring. And indeed, you know, this is one of just many examples in nature where one hazard may give way to another, either by triggering it, predisposing uh, nature to that second hazard. Um, and so, for example, extending the wildfire uh, context here, we have wildfires burning in Santa Barbara and a few months later in 2018, severe landslides in Montecito. This is caused by the fire destabilizing the soil structure and also leaving a hydrophobic residue over which water 
uh, easily glides across. Um, but in addition to sort of this uh, sort of sequential uh, ordering of these hazards, you also have compounding or simultaneous hazards where they co-occur at the same time and place. And so as this image here is alluding to, this is seen oftentimes in hurricanes. And it's important in our eyes because this can both impact behavioral and social responses and infrastructure that we build to uh, fortify against these hazards. And one occurring with the other can also modify its impact to make it even more hazardous. Uh, and so going back to our analogy here of, of temperature and wildfire, uh, it's something that we definitely want to be thinking about, but more than just the fire itself, we really want to be thinking about the air pollution, the particulate matter that's 2.5 micrometers in diameter that is seen as the most deleterious to human health. So really creating this whole framework um, and thinking about the overlay of those two hazards. Um, they are indeed deleterious to our health. So heat by most recent estimates of Zhao and colleagues in Lancet uh, project about 480,000 excess deaths per year uh, due to extreme heat globally. And uh, Johnston and her colleagues, they estimated about 340,000 uh, premature deaths due to landscape smoke. Uh, so, you know, the question for us that we want to be thinking about ultimately is, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, are they going to make us feel even worse than when they operate individually on the human body? Um, and so it's really getting at the intersection of this Venn diagram here um, that we ultimately would like to go and, and uncover with our work. Um, in the meantime, though, before we can really speak to those outcomes, we really want to get at when, where, how often, and who's being affected by these co-occurrences. And so that's really going to be the focus of what I um, am presenting uh, to you all today. So starting off, um, I'd, I'd like to just share what data sources we're going to be or talking about or using for this analysis. Uh, for air pollution, uh, and particulate matter 2.5, we're going to start off by using uh, NOAA's high resolution rapid refresh model. This is a forecasting model that NOAA uh, produces it updates it about every 12 hours and 48 hours into the future. And this is sort of seen as state of the art. And it's a, what's really great about this data set is that it's specific to wildfire smoke. And it's also produced at a three by three kilometer pixel resolution, allowing for really high and precise spatial estimates of what the wildfire smoke concentrations will be um, at sort of at these different 12 hour initializations moving 48 hours uh, forward into the future. Uh, again, though, this is just to keep in mind a forecast model, so it won't always match perfectly to what we observe on the ground. Um, and so this is just uh, an, an example of us going ahead and validating the performance of this model. And indeed, we find a correlation coefficient of about 0.8. Um, and we do so compared to ground stations, which are seen as the gold standard. These are stations that intake local air uh, samples and will uh, perform what's called um, beta attenuation to understand the mass of the particulate matter in the air. Um, and so, you know, this is an example just showing of how it, for this Modesto station, there was pretty good agreement in the magnitude and the time series. I will note, however, that these ground stations collect particulate matter from all sources that includes you know, combustion of gasoline or fertilizers that get aerosolized. Um, whereas our the, the NOAA smoke outputs from the HER model, those are specific to wildfire. And indeed, that is the specific source of particulate matter that we want to be focusing on for this work. In addition to the HER data set, we use an empirical. So rather than just a forecast, we add on top of that an empirical estimate of smoke exposure. And that's the hazard mapping system that NOAA also produces. Um, this entails uh, expert analysts uh, actually tracing out the plume itself and overlaying those plumes on top of detected fires. So really making that attribution to the source. Uh, and this is a great data set in the sense that it provides those plumes that are observed, not necessarily forecasted. Some shortcomings though, are that they are only at sort of the plume level, meaning that we only get to see not necessarily the full three by three kilometer grid cells, uh, which her provides, um, but just the plume extent itself. And moreover, that this plume um, is only categorized in one of three magnitudes of, of density of smoke. Uh, 
So, you know, that doesn't give us as much of a continuous measurement uh, as we would like, since the maximum sort of smoke concentration is said to correspond to about 27 micrograms per meter cubed. Well, we'll see shortly that sometimes the wildfires emit much higher concentrations than that. And so that's something else to be keeping in mind. The other thing I will note and caveat with the HMS data is that it's not necessarily focused on ground level smoke, which is what, of course, is going to be most threatening to human beings. Um, this focuses on the entire column. So it can be that for particularly intense fires that are radiating smoke into the atmosphere, um, even so high as the troposphere, uh, that we uh, need to be keeping sort of that caveat in mind. By contrast, the HER model is seen as surface level or about 30, within the first 30 feet uh, elevation. And for heat, we use GridMet. Um, this is an interpolated data set that is uh, across the entire continental United States. Uh, this resolution is about four kilometers by four kilometers uh, and goes all the way back to 1970. It provides us with the maximum temperature and the maximum relative humidity in a given day and pixel. And so uh, we're able to combine those into the heat index, which is a much more accurate proxy for heat stress that people experience. Um, so what we then do is with these data sets, we operationalize them by looking at exceedances over benchmarks that we consider to be normal. And so those exceedances will then constitute a hazardous event. So for the, in, the, in the case of heat, what we do is for every single four by four kilometer pixel, we look at the entire set of temperatures that were recorded in August and July over this 30 year period between 1980 and 2010. And we find the 85th percentile of those recorded temperatures, meaning at what temperature, what temperature 85% of other measurements are below that, that magnitude. Um, and we do so for the minimum heat index, actually, because it is the minimum heat index that's been found to be more representative of heat stress and more positively correlated with hospitalizations. Uh, and then for smoke, we use uh, for the HER data, which provides this continuous measure um, from zero to theoretically it could be infinity, um, the, uh, the concentration of 20 micrograms per meter cubed. This was found by Liu and Associates as representing the 98th percentile of wildfire smoke measured across 560 Western counties in the United States between the years of 2004 and 2009. So we see that as, a, as like a pretty good benchmark to compare against. For the HMS data set, which again, only has one of those three categorical rankings, we just use the most severe ranking, which is deemed heavy, or as I mentioned earlier, roughly is expected to correspond to 27 micrograms um, per meter cubed. And when we have each exceedance then mapped out, we look at where they co-occur in space and time across that three by three kilometer pixel. And we do so all of this analysis for the summer of 2020 between the months of June uh, to the very end of November. And we do so in Google Earth Engine, which is a cloud-based platform for analyzing satellite data and other remote sensed uh, sources. So getting at when. So what we see is that generally uh, these events, both in terms of heat exceedances, smoke exceedances, and their overlap, um, they tend to occur most in uh, the August and September months, though for heat, it definitely spans the entire duration of this uh, sort of five month data set. Um, and, and, you know, that there does tend to be some lag from a heat wave occurring or a heat exceedance event occurring and um, followed by potential wildfires and therefore uh, compounding events. When we strip away those individual hazards, uh, we get to see more clearly that these areas that are that are um, experiencing compounding of both heat and smoke uh, are in the hundreds of thousands of square kilometers and do tend to correlate quite nicely with the outbreaks of the fires themselves. Now moving on to where and how often we're seeing these. Uh, so we tend to see it broadly throughout the entire state of California. It's really in the southern desert that we're perhaps seeing less of these events. Um, but that it does constitute about 75% of California's area that has seen at least one or more compounding events of extreme heat and extreme smoke uh, in a given day and location. Um, the most number of days in total throughout this five-month period that we analyzed uh, were about 24 days, and those were in the Sierras. Uh, 
uh, as you can see sort of in the top right of the state's boundary. And when we also look at the consecutiveness of those days, meaning that one day after the other after the other was compounding, we see that there was a maximum consecutive run of about 11 days in that very uh, like highly red area in the Sierras that you're seeing um, on the top right uh, there. And this is all with the herd data I should preface. Um, so moving on, we wanted to see, well, when we have these exceedances, what is the, the typical magnitude of those exceedances? Um, so on the left, that's for smoke. And you're seeing that when we look at sort of the maximum um, exceedances in a given pixel over the course of that season, and we take the average of that throughout the entire state, it's about 271 micrograms per meter cubed um, in excess of that 20 micrograms per meter cubed baseline threshold that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that's quite significant. To give you a reference point, um, the EPA recommends no greater daily exposure than about 35 micrograms per meter cubed from PM 2.5 over a 24 uh, hour period and about a 12 hour across the entire year. And we're seeing, in fact, in its most concentrated areas, uh, according to the HER model, forecast model, that, that, uh, that in some of the, near these wildfires, uh, one could expect to have as many as 2,100 micrograms per meters cubed, extremely hazardous smoke conditions. And then for looking at the minimum heat index exceedances, uh, so we see about as many as, you know, as high as 24 Fahrenheit above that uh, 85th percentile for that specific location. And uh, on average, those exceedances amount to about 10.2 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, so uh, moving on, we wanted to basically repeat this analysis using the HMS data. As I mentioned earlier, the HMS data consists of these irregularly shaped plumes that it assigns a uniform value, specifically one of these three categories. So to do as best of an apples to apples comparison, we effectively translate that into a raster uh, format or into these uh, grid cells where we chop off the state of California uh, into those three by three kilometer grid cells. And wherever the irregular polygon overlays on that grid, we will assign the value of the polygon to that grid cell. And so in this case, uh, we're, when we do that analysis, we see that the, the maximum number of days observed for a given pixel um, in the state of California during 2020 was up to 32 days, so larger than what was estimated with the HER model. Um, and so you know, this, again, can speak to the fact that uh, they are more liberally drawn out and there is a uniform uh, there is a uniform value assigned to that to that entire plume such that it will be less conservative in the spatial extent of those areas experiencing uh, severe uh, heat. And importantly, unlike the HER data, the HMS data does qualify areas in the Los Angeles metropolitan area as experiencing um, ex uh, compounding events. Um, a much larger population center. And indeed, this then results in a large discrepancy between the populations that we estimate are being affected, where HMS has about 35 million people um, across the, the state of California, or approximately 90% uh, of the population. Oh, by contrast, the HER model only estimated about 19 million people being affected by one or more compounding events. It also uh, estimates HMS a much larger uh, total extent captured by one or more events throughout that season. So now moving on to who um, is affected by this data. Well, we see again that at least looking at the forecasted models of her, uh, the Los Angeles metropolitan area was spared and that's quite significant given that it is the most uh, uh, populated area and densely populated area uh, in the state of California. Other parts of the San Francisco Bay area as well um, were, were relatively spared. And it is really in the Central Valley and in those Northern regions that we do see uh, predominant exposure to compounding events. Um, and, you know, again, this is important to be thinking about, of course, in a socioeconomic lens, an equity lens. When we overlay this or think about how this maps towards Calenvira screen, uh, which combines sociodemographic information throughout the state and then ranks across the 8,000 census tracts in the state of California. You know, we need to be thinking about these cities like Mendota, um, which are in Western Fresno County, a predominantly agricultural workforce. In fact, it's the capital of Cantaloupe for California. And we see that across these different risk factors, including linguistic isolation or poverty, this uh, census tract and its inhabitants rank across about 99th percentile 
meaning that they are poorer than 99% of the other census tracts in California. And you know, this is really important to be thinking about because it is the agricultural worker who can often be the most exposed to both heat and smoke or heat and smoke at the same time. And again, we wanna be thinking, and we won't be doing this for this, this presentation today, but as next steps, you know, uh, my research group and I, we're gonna be thinking about how we can uh, tie this into different health outcomes. Um, and also thinking about behavioral outcomes, right? If you're supposed to be wearing an N95 mask to protect you from particulate matter 2.5, um, you know, what happens when it's 100 degrees outside? Are you less likely to wear that mask all of a sudden? So just quick takeaways. I know I, I, I might be over time here uh, with the, with the um, technical difficulty, but just to say that um, we're seeing that these events span the whole summer that the HER model is more conservative in its spatial extent, but is likely more accurate um, given that it focuses specifically on surface levels, um, that a large percentage of Californias are likely experiencing one or more of these compounding events. So that it may very well be a, a considerable public health risk we should be thinking about. Um, and then finally, uh, we, as next steps, as I mentioned, wanna be thinking about how these co-occurrences are either having physiological impacts on the body or affecting human behavior such that they may be modifying the risk that we experience. And then looking beyond 2020 at decadal trends and thinking about how and what's causing changes, increases, decreases in the areas that are experiencing some compounding and then maybe whether we can even predict those events themselves. Uh, so just want to thank my collaborators and my advisors, Dr. Miriam Marlier, Dr. Tarek Bermaria, uh, for their support. Thank you, Noam, and for fitting it all in. Um, and uh, I think we can take a few extra minutes out of the end of session group discussion to allow you to have some time to accommodate those glitches. Um, we got a question about what would be a policy response that you'd like to see follow from your research? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's difficult to say so until we really know more about the outcomes and how the, you know, these compounding events are affecting people. But I think really the most you can do then is to just anticipate them in advance um, and to be maybe setting, uh, you know, stricter labor uh, uh, health and safety uh, codes. Uh, so Cal OSHA, for, for example, um, or uh, yeah, even at the federal level. But it, I, I would say it's a little premature to be thinking about that until we really understand how these compounding events are affecting people. Fair enough. Um, and an earlier question pointed out that the Johnston paper is from 2012 and that likely you might expect a lot greater mortality now. Um, so I wonder if you wanted to speak to that. Sure, yeah. Um, I, there, there may even be a, a more recent publication from Johnston um, that I'm missing, but uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely estimate that uh, there, there has been an uptick um, although, you know, remember that this is the Johnson paper is looking at all sources of PM of, of landscape fire, not necessarily particulate matter 2.5. Um, and it is around the globe. So surely in California, we feel like things have gotten a lot worse and, and they really haven't throughout the world, including Australia or Europe, as we've seen this summer. Um, but there are also, you know, large populations exposed to agricultural burns. Um, and other sources of pollution that are having large forms uh, impacts on mortality that may not have seen as much differences over the years. So yeah, it's a good question, but I, I'm just speculating at this point and would, would rather refer you to a better source uh, at another point. That's fair enough. And, and I think there's a fair point to say it, it depends on the scale and the temporal scale. Um, it's useful looking at diaries from the 1800s that suggest that right now is actually normal smoke and the past hundred years have been abnormal smoke because we're suppressing everything. So even that could shape what we're getting. I was curious, let's see, um, somebody says Marshall Burke's group at Stanford has done a lot of recent work on the mortality from wildfire smoke. And I think the final question I would ask is, um, how do you see the interactions between the protective actions you can take for each of these activities and whether or not they're complementary or they might be places where they're counterproductive. So for instance, particularly with poorer people, um, poor people, they can't afford air conditioning. So for heat, we tell people to go inside because of smoke or for smoke, we tell them to go inside, which there's questions how effective that is. But if they don't have air conditioning and their house is really hot. So I just was curious about what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And that's the question that we're asking and hoping to get at with sort of the next steps of this research. Um, you know, thinking about the fact that 
uh, yeah, when it is really hot outside, somebody who can afford to work indoors and, and be indoors with AC and air filters, um, they might be less exposed to smoke than they would be otherwise, especially the person who didn't even know that smoke was a problem. Um, and then by contrast, the person who doesn't have the choice to stay home um, or doesn't have good air filtration, uh, you could see sort of a trapping of that air quality, um, perhaps for longer periods than if they were sort of naturally blown away by the wind. And so um, I think that those are the exact kinds of questions that we need to be asking and that we wanna be thinking about with this research. Fantastic. Um... There's a number of comments about uh, other studies and papers, and one person says you, he, they don't think you're missing anything with the Johnston paper. And just to go back, the response about the spatial re resolution on the vulnerability map is it's roughly one kilometer. Is there anything, I want to give you a chance to say any, one thing, anything else, given that you had your technical glitch and had to be kind of rushed? Uh, no, I would just like to thank everyone for their patience and, and we're looking forward to sort of, I, you know, maybe it's a little underwhelming without the outcomes yet, but um, our hope is to, to, to share outcome, the impact of these compounding hazards on outcomes of human health uh, rather soon. Great. Well, thank you very much, Noam. I appreciate your talk and what you, you're doing. I think, again, it's really important work and the type of thinking that we really need to um, be thinking more broadly and contextually about fire and where it fits with everything else. So now we'll move on to Catherine McConnell, who is a PhD candidate with Yale University. And Catherine, I will give you your full time, time span, so don't worry about rushing. Great, thanks so much. Can you hear me okay, Sarah? Yeah, you're great. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining. It's really a pleasure to be able to um, share these findings with you and hopefully get some feedback and questions at the end, um, as well as to hear about the great work that's being done by other folks on the panel. My name is Catherine McConnell. I'm a PhD candidate at Yale School of the Environment, where I study primarily sociology, but I also integrate remote sensing and geospatial methods into my work. Um, as we've seen this summer, many communities are increasingly exposed to wildfires. So understanding which specific types of buildings as well as which specific neighborhoods are most likely to be impacted is really critical. Um, I situate my research around these questions in sort of two main bodies of work, um, both social science as well as physical fire science. So in particular, I draw from a phenomenon that's been described extensively in sociology as filtering, which is the idea that low-income residents and people of color often end up living in physically deteriorated homes, which are at higher hazard risk, which thus in turn causes these households to experience heightened exposure to disaster impacts like fires when they take place. While this trend of filtering has been well established in the context of other hazards like flooding, hurricanes, earthquakes, um, to my knowledge, it really has not been well documented in the context of wildfires. I also draw from emerging conversations around this idea of climate gentrification, and in particular, the idea of cost burden climate gentrification, which posits that as living in a particular area becomes increasingly hazardous, only more affluent residents will have the resources to rebuild after shock events um, or to prepare their homes to be adaptive such that they're able to remain in place. But I also draw on physical science literature where there's been some really great work on fire damage and fire risk. Um, but from my standpoint, there's still a need to understand within a fire damage zone, or so after a fire takes place, not just in the Rui, which specific structures survive and which do not which is a slightly different question at a different spatial scale than asking which general regions are more or less likely to experience a fire or fire impacts into the future. Um, finally, I would say my research is also focused on not just the fire event, but on long-term reconstruction following wildfires, which we know from sociological research is really sort of a critical time frame in which post-disaster inequalities, social inequalities, often become exacerbated. To the best of my knowledge, there's fairly limited research on what reconstruction looks like in different geographic and social contexts. Um, and the work that's been done, which I very much build on, um, relies on really, really hard, painstaking work where researchers have to look at aerial imagery uh, over thousands of buildings. Um, and this ultimately means that the scale of analysis for this type of research historically has been more spatially limited. 
So the context for the work I'll be presenting today is in the aftermath of the 2018 campfire, which many, if not most of you are probably familiar with, but for those of you who may not be, um, the campfire was one of the most destructive fires in the country's history. It took place in Butte County, California in 2018 and destroyed uh, much, but not all of the town of Paradise, as well as surrounding unincorporated communities of Miguelia, Yankee Hill, and, and Concow. Um, this area generally was more of a blue collar retirement community. A lot of folks moved there seeking affordable housing in a state that's experiencing otherwise a housing crisis. And we've seen in the several years since the fire, at this point almost three years, that reconstruction has been very slow, with around 400 homes being rebuilt as of this past summer. So my research on fire damage patterns, uh, mo or most research on fire damage patterns thus far has been conducted primarily by physical science. Um, and this research describes three primary scales at which the physical characteristics of a place are likely to influence damage outcomes. So at the building scale, factors like a structure's defensible space or what type of material the roof was made out of um, all can influence the odds of that structure surviving in a fire. Sort of zooming out at the neighborhood scale, factors like how close to each other buildings are within a larger cluster of buildings can also play a role in determining survival likelihood. And then finally, zooming out quite far at the landscape scale, the presence of flammable materials like dry trees or shrubs um, in the broader area can influence destruction patterns. But we know from a social science standpoint that these physical characteristics of landscapes, neighborhoods, and houses um, are all very much informed and in some ways co-constituted with the social and economic dynamics of these places. So for example, development patterns and land use laws will influence regional physical development patterns. Um, and whether a neighborhood is primarily composed of say mobile homes on one hand or luxury mansions on the other will also tell you a lot about what physical materials those homes are likely built out of, how close together or far apart these homes probably are, and whether or not they have defensible space cleared. Additionally, unlike other hazards, human responses play a really integral role in controlling the extent of that wildfire damage. So you don't call someone to come put out a hurricane or to come put out a flood, but you do have to call a group of people to come help put out a fire. So I think that we should also be uh, investigating and thinking about the ways that both firefighter as well as resident responses will be informed by the physical aspects of the landscape as well as the social aspects of the landscape. And just to sort of get you thinking along the lines, think for example of how private firefighters are now increasingly available to protect heavily insured homes, but lower value homes don't have the same sort of insurance. For the work I'll be showing today, I want to sort of get into this larger um, integrated social and physical model, but I'm just taking a small snapshot of this larger picture of, of how I think um, fire damage is operating. I'm considering both the socioeconomic and physical characteristics at the building scale, as well as physical characteristics at both the neighborhood and the landscape scale. And I have three core research questions that I'll be talking about today, um, spending most of my time addressing the first two. Um, initially, I wanted to understand whether there were differential destruction outcomes across different, I guess I would call them social types of buildings. So whether commercial, single family homes, multifamily homes, or mobile homes and RVs as different categories had different survival rates during the campfire. Second, I wanted to evaluate whether pre-fire home price predicted odds of survival or odds of being destroyed in the fire. And then finally, I examined whether um, a given structure was owner-occupied or absentee owner-occupied, which in my mind I'm thinking about as a proxy for renter status, um, predicts likelihood of survival. Um, second, after evaluating whether there are in fact differential impacts across building types, I want to try to get into the physical characteristics of these different buildings to understand sort of what is it about a higher income home or a lower income home physically that causes differential vulnerability um, to wildfire damage. And then finally, um, looking in the longer term, I've started developing techniques to evaluate uh, what sort of spatial patterns of reconstruction are emerging after the fire. I want to quickly walk through how I've calculated some of the variables that I'm using here, or at least the scale at which they're calculated. Um, I draw from a lot of existing fire science literature to calculate around 20 or so different physical variables for each of the 
18,000 plus buildings within the campfire burn footprint. This data comes originally from CAL FIRE. Um, and I evaluate first at the building scale, a number of factors such as, for example, how many buildings are within a 40 meter radius of every different building within the burn footprint. Um, then I zoom out to the cluster level. Um, clusters are calculated by examining the overlap of buildings within a 100 meter radius. So for example, in the middle here, you can see these three buildings at the bottom are one cluster, whereas the one building at the top is its own single cluster sort of out on its own. Um, here I'm calculating metrics such as density of buildings per cluster or the distance from each home to the edge of a cluster. And then finally, zooming out to sort of the largest spatial scale, uh, I examine the broader landscape in which a building is situated using a 2,500 meter radius as um, my metric. And again, I'm happy to go into details about the various uh, variables I calculate, but these are principally drawn from published work already. And um, I list them here and I'll sort of leave them in case we want to return afterwards. Um, but to dig into some of the results, um, again, I ask, whether destruction outcomes varied by structure type. And I'll be sharing um, results from log logistic regression modeling, um, first with only the social characteristics of buildings included, where the binary outcome variable is one, a building was destroyed, or zero, a building was not destroyed. And we can see that the results largely affirm that the campfire did cause unequal impacts across the lines that we would hypothesized. First, we see that compared to any other structure type, the category of mobile homes and RVs were the most likely of all building types to be completely destroyed in the fire. Second, as the value of the home increased, the likelihood of destruction decreased, where in other words, more expensive homes were less likely to be destroyed in the fire. And finally, we see that owner-occupied homes were less likely to be destroyed and absentee owner-occupied homes, again, rent probably renters, were more likely to be destroyed. So after identifying these differential impacts, um, I then integrate the many physical characteristics of each structure that I described earlier. My goal here is to try to explain what is it physically about these structures that make them more susceptible to being destroyed. Because there are so many variables, um, I'm not showing you the full regression results here, but instead I'm pulling out some of those which were highly significant in the log logistic regression models. Um, first, we see that steeper slope was associated with higher odds of structure loss. Um, but interestingly, a number of variables related to the larger identity of density were also very significant. So buildings that were closer to other buildings or in close proximity to a higher number of buildings or in dense building clusters were all more likely to be destroyed in the fire. So these findings are especially interesting to me because they're somewhat different from past research on fire damage patterns, which tends to find that lower density developments are actually more vulnerable to fire damage. And I think that this may speak to some more unique dynamics um, of house to house burning in the campfire. Here's another way of visualizing these results. Um, each of these globs represents a building cluster. So you can see that um, with these, there are two very large clusters, sort of the center of town in the middle, and then um, I, I think this is Paradise Pines up in Megalia to the north. Um, you can see by the similarity in color patterns that higher density at the cluster level also tended to correspond with a higher proportion of buildings destroyed in the fire. So surprisingly, after I introduced these 20 or so physical characteristics into the model, both mobile home RV status, as well as the pre-fire home value, remain significant predictors of structure loss. So in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, there's something going on with these structures which caused them to have heightened vulnerability to being destroyed, but I can't fully explain what that is with my existing model. To walk through a few possibilities, and I love your feedback and thoughts here, um, first, defensible space metrics and home hardening characteristics um, have not yet been integrated into the model. So these are two areas that might be playing a role in, in heightened vulnerability. But it also might well be the case that there are simply attributes of these buildings that are not well documented in existing literature and that we, we need more research to better understand why we see these un, uneven fire burdens. Additionally, um, response to the fire, both on the part of residents as well as official responders, may have differed, causing some of these differential outcomes. Um, it's still unclear, though, and I think this merits a lot further investigation. 
I want to touch on some of the policy implications of these findings for how we think about wildfire mitigation policy. Um, and here, especially, I'd appreciate feedback from those of you who are working on the ground or in this field. Um, take a look at this snapshot. I've pulled out only mobile homes and RVs within a sort of zoomed in area of the, of the burn footprint. Um, you can see that many of these, which are set up in mobile home parks, are very, very close to each other. You also will notice that the dark red indicates that a building was totally destroyed. So in other words, um, mobile home parks had very high structure loss rates. So in my mind, this raises a question about existing defensible space guidelines, which advise generally a certain radius from a home in which flammable materials are cleared. But if we consider a structure itself or a building itself to be highly flammable, uh, which was very much the case for much of the campfire burn footprint, then we see that it's actually not structurally possible for many mobile homes to meet the criteria of defensible space set out in most guidance by the state. So this is how I'm thinking about sort of the broader policy implications of this work. And again, would really appreciate your feedback. Um, first, that we see that the buildings which house residents who tend to already be in more financially precarious situations, so renters, lower income residents, and residents of mobile homes, were also more likely to be in buildings that would be destroyed in the fire. So in essence, there's a sort of compounding of both locational vulnerability to fire damage with very likely social vulnerability as well. To me, this opens up questions around how these specific residents can be better supported, um, and in particular, focusing on residents of mobile homes. Second, drawing from existing fire science literatures, as well as the results from this research, we see that factors at different scales influence, different, influence destruction outcomes. So many of these characteristics are not just at the building level, but rather they're at the neighborhood scale or sort of the regional scale. To me, this suggests that we need to focus sort of planning and mitigation efforts on a wider scale beyond simply individual focused policy guidance. So conversations around defensible space and home hardening are critical, but I think they're one of many scales at which fire destruction outcomes are actually operating. Um, lastly, I want to walk through the work that I'm building on reconstruction, which is still ongoing. And again, my goal is to map patterns of building reconstruction and ultimately to investigate whether the social characteristics of a home predict the odds that that home will be rebuilt after the fire, which is in line with these larger conversations around post-disaster gentrification. Um, to answer this question, the main sort of analytical obstacle is creating a variable which measures whether a building is rebuilt or not. So to do this, I use fine scale aerial imagery from the USDA's National Aerial Imagery Program, which is freely available. Um, if any of you are interested in using this, I'd be happy to um, share it with you or walk through how to use it. And um, essentially I take images from before the wildfire and after the wildfire and analyze them in Google Earth's Engine's cloud computing platform. I mean, in this platform, I've been able to develop a support machine uh, algorithm, support vector machine algorithm, which can classify these aerial images um, and map where buildings are or are not present. To build this algorithm, I draw from a data set created by Microsoft, which was put out around 2018, which maps every building in the United States, um, as shown here in this New York Times piece. Um, this data set actually has pretty, I would say, limited scholarly value as a primary data source, but I draw from these building footprints, which are all vectors, sort of millions of vectors, to create training data that's used ultimately to produce my algorithm. So ultimately, the algorithm is able to classify building presence decently well. You can see it applied here in both pre-fire and post-fire images, where black represents buildings and white represents not buildings. And um, you can tell that the, it's misidentifying roads, but that's fairly straightforward to mask out in our final analysis. Um, for those of you who might be a bit deeper in machine learning methods, I'm reporting accuracy statistics here at the pixel level for this algorithm, which I'm pretty happy with, um, but still working to improve. You can see that the algorithm is even able to pick out small mobile homes or trailers from within a landscape, um, which in some cases is a sign that rebuilding is on the horizon. Um, but bringing this technique back to the original research question, which types of buildings are more likely um, to be rebuilt, having this tool ultimately helps me as a researcher not have to visually inspect each of the 18,000 plus buildings that were destroyed, but instead being able to narrow my analysis and examine 
just the 1600 which were identified by the algorithm. So that will be my next step in this research. Thanks so much for your attention. I, I really appreciate it. Also want to give acknowledgement to collaborators at NASA, Yale, and UC Boulder, um, as well as funders at the National Science Foundation and NASA. Um, if I can answer any questions or if the work that I'm doing is at all of use, especially for those of you working in, in policy and planning, um, please be in touch. I would really appreciate opening up conversations. So thanks so much. Thank you, Catherine. That was a really um, interesting presentation. A nice compliment to the other two that we've had. Um, I will start with some questions that came to mind for me. Um, in terms of, I, I do think that part of the explanation for the higher loss in mobile homes is around the home hardening mm -hmm. part of the equation that you didn't measure. Mm -hmm. um, and the the dependable space, I think, also comes into play, although less so with um, the mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. But um, I do really like your idea about the fact that we are looking too much at the individual level. We seem to focus on mitigation either at the landscape scale or the individual property scale. And that meso scale, I think, is really an important one to look at. So mm -hmm. I think that that's a great idea. And the other comment I would have that um, is in relation to sort of your finding that denser development had more losses. I was actually very happy to see that finding because that's everything mm -hmm. I see supports that. Mm -hmm. um, and the studies that suggest that less dense have higher losses, I often think that some of the assumptions they make huh. actually um, lead to the conclusion they get. Interesting. So I was curious about some of your thoughts on that and maybe a way to go about that is sort of the the logic for the hundred meter meter hundred meter radius to define clusters and hmm. whether or not that is what the logic of that is. Yeah. So questions and thanks so much. Um, I would love to follow up with you and talk about the work that you've been doing and seeing about density. Um, the work that I pull from that finds that less dense neighborhoods are more likely to experience high levels of damage. I think was isolated to maybe three or four different fires. And so I think for me, there's a question of how different fires in different places and different landscapes act differently. And in particular, that the campfire was a fast moving fire and, and these other fires that were examined, I don't believe were. So I think more work needs to be done to evaluate a broader population of fires. Um, in terms of why the 100 meters was chosen for clusters, um, really, my goal was just to completely mimic what physical scientists do and trust their judgment, um, because that's getting a little bit out of my lane as a sociologist. So uh, maybe this merits further investigation. And if you think that using a different radius would be more appropriate, I would be very keen to hear that feedback. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I know what the right radius is, but I always think it's good to question the yeah. Yeah. what people use. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will get on to the question we have in the screen, but I did want to sort of say, I think your point about a broader population of fires makes a lot of sense. The other question I have often had um, is, does the outcome differ depending upon the fire regime? So different mm -hmm. fire regimes have different types of fire behavior. Mm -hmm. It might mean denser development works better in one mm -hmm. fire regime and not so well in another. Yeah. So that's, I think, fitting in with that. Yeah. So, Gnome asked um, what your data sources were for estimating home value and occupancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And I know I went pretty lightly over the data sources used, so happy to answer any more detailed questions about specific variables. So those were taken from um, a company called CoreLogic aggregates property data, and I have access to this through my university. But I, my understanding is that they basically do the work of collecting those data from county records. So these data would likely also be available simply from the county, though I access them through CoreLogic. And then the next question is the $100 million question. If you can answer this, it'll be fantastic. Um, how should cities or counties undertake adaptation planning considering these physical and social predictors in their fire response and mitigation plan? I think this, the, my findings really speak to specific resident types who are more likely to experience damage. And so we can think about what 
what needs those residents may have for mitigation. So if you are someone who is low income, living in a house that um, due to its physical characteristics has heightened, is more likely to burn, um, you might need more assistance to do home hardening or to um, create defensible space. But I think in other cases, so especially for mobile home parks, like the, the standard logic we have or the guidance we have around things like defensible space doesn't totally apply or it's not totally possible. Um, and I think a lot more work is needed from the physical science and to understand what specific materials are used in mobile homes and RVs and how flammable those are and how fire is transmitted between buildings. Um, but I think attention to um, dense areas rather than homeowners who have large yards that can be cleared up to 100 meters. Um, like when I go to CAL FIRE's website, the example photo that's available or sort of diagram that's available for defensible space is a single family home with a large yard that can clear 100 meters. And not everyone owns their home. We have renters who may not have the same motivations to keep up their property. And not everyone lives in a single family home that has that much space to clear. So how can we adapt guidance for residents that live in different structure types? I think is my sort of uh, garbled response. It's a hard I question. Don't think, I don't think that's a garbled response at all. I think that's an excellent response that we've had the same recommendations for about 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Whitney, do you want to bring everybody else back on stage so that if we can have any final conversation or questions? Um, the question I would put to, I'll start with you, Catherine, since you're available, but others, please be thinking about that, is um, today we've sort of heard three talks that look and think about vulnerability from different angles. Um, and I'm just kind of curious how you see the interrelationships between them or conflicts between them. Um, vulnerability is one of these really interesting terms that it's like risk. What does risk actually mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think about it in two ways as uh, sort of social vulnerability, sort of what capacities do a given household have to sort of respond to damage or to adapt and prevent damage, but also locational vulnerability, which has a lot more to do with the physical place where you're living and whether the physical nature of that place heightens your exposure. Um, and so I think it's really important then to sort of separate those two ideas and then ultimately analyze them in conjunction to see where we may have compounding locational and social vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, Mason, do you have anything to add to that? Or uh, Noam, I'm not sure if you're back on or you've disappeared. There you are. Do either of you have anything, you Mason or Lily, Lillian? Or Noam? Yeah, no, I mean, I think... Um... It, 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 I would think that in terms of physical resilience to these hazards, it, it definitely will be different from, from a home to wildfire than a human being to smoke and heat. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that there's a, a, a large amount of overlap between, you know, the, the people who are both their, their personal health is exposed and their personal property is exposed. And, um, and surely loss of your property will affect your, your mental health. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's, the, you know, I think that, um, yeah, there, there, there may even be more overlap than I'm giving credit at the moment. But, um, yeah, those are just some, some initial thoughts that I have. Yeah, there's, there's also research that says long-term smoke exposure affects mental health. So that's another one. Mason and Lillian, do you guys have any thoughts? Oh, there you go. We were having some technical difficulties. Do you mind running that question by us one more time? Um, it's just around sort of like all these different definitions of vulnerability and how we're approaching thinking about vulnerability and where there might be complementary things or conflicts or considerations we need to be thinking about how vulnerability might be interpreted differently depending on the context. Sure. On the nose too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With yes. ours. Um, we definitely encountered the need to be very specific about what vulnerability meant in creating a vulnerability map. Um, so I guess in terms of our formulation, that's a realistic model. I don't know if it is um, a more of service to the folks that like that term is meant to benefit. 
um, to have a stringent definition or to have a more flexible, like um, kind of application based definition. I don't know if you had any thoughts on it. That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because like definitely we were talking about how um, all of the different intervention strategies that these groups used are specific, like home hardening is for um, mm -hmm. people thinking about wildfire affecting their home, whereas like smoke preparedness can be a much broader um, outside of the wooey group of people. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I think Mason said it well. Yep, yep those are all make sense. And I'm going to throw another question at all all three groups um, because I think it's one that I often hear that I, I feel like it's a very simplistic whenever we have fires, why do we let anybody live where there's a fire hazard? What would be your response to that question? A lot of my colleagues on the East Coast who live in areas that will be underwater because of sea level rise ask me this and I find it deeply ironic. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to have much broader conversations around uh, how, where federal subsidies are going and who benefits and who doesn't benefit. And it's really hard and a lot of people will likely end up moving um, by choice or not by choice. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And um, something that like we were talking about within the other Climate Action Corps fellows working on wildfire were like the incentives motivating local governments to uh, continue to allow development in these areas. Um, and we're we're op optimistic that there is some like statewide legislation in California that is going to limit um, development in like very high hazard very severity zones. Um, but yeah. yeah. And I, I think also realistically, right? Like um, Catherine hinted that like wildfire hazard is, is a risk for um, nearly anybody or nearly every area, I should say, um, in the state of California. And um, I think that another key piece to look at is, is the ignition sources of the wildfires rather than people, there's a lot of people and they need to, <laughs> they need to live somewhere. Um, so I think that it's, yeah, sometimes more useful um, <laughs> to look at what's starting them to. Yeah. yeah. And I would just add, you know, I, I also come from somewhat of an insurance perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that there's a sort of a, a, a big change, a sea change happening in this state around insurability of homes. And one could argue that that is the market speaking and let, you know, uh, it's a good indicator that to, to say, don't move here, or it's a good indicator to say, move somewhere else. But I think the people who've been living somewhere for a long time, and have had you know reasonable insurance, and you know now that we live in this hotter climate, that their risk has you know it's not their fault that now they're in a much riskier area than than ten years ago. Um, but I do think there's also you know so you could say that maybe to the credit of Ricardo Lara at the Department of Insurance in California, moratoriums and other sort of interventions to protect consumers are good things. But then are we also sort of just perpetuating this cycle and and ultimately making it harder for insurers to operate in the state in the long term. So I think that's um, perhaps where the rubber meets the road um, in, in this new uh, question of housing and wildfire. Yeah, all, all your answers get at sort of the complexity. And, and the reason why I ask it is because that question, that solution is a very simplistic solution that ends up overlooking all sorts of things. And you know, my response is always, OK, so what hazard do you want them to move to? Right, exactly. California, like they're going to move to another hazard. And no, my uh, the insurance is right on point. And in the end, I'm kind of like a lot of this also boils down to an equity issue, which is those who have money will always be able to live where they want and build where they want and self insure. And a lot of your presentations were getting at the fact that people who are most vulnerable are the people who don't have a lot of resources. Does that mean that they, you know, where are they supposed to live safely? And I think all three of you have done a great job of highlighting some of the things that we need to be thinking about to answer those questions. So thank you all three for four, <laughs> all four for your excellent presentations. Um, I wanna remind everybody that the, there is a plenary session or coming up uh, round table at 1230 in 15 minutes. I hope everybody can join for that. And um, thank you all also for
talks that were right on time, fantastic, and made my job very easy. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Thank you for facilitating. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you.